And we're back. All right. Oh, the screen. Sorry, it took me a little bit longer. I was setting up the, uh, the Scrivener file because uh, I forgot to do it. I should have done it earlier. <laughs> So yeah, um, so yeah, log lines, um, oh no, I guess I'll go back to this for a sec. So log lines are something that are commonly used in film, but I've seen increasing, um, increasing recommendations, uh, by people online who do short stories and novels and all that to write a log line for for more literary works, um, mostly because it's a good way to summarize your idea in uh, one or two sentences. Excuse me. I don't know what's up with my throat today. Um, so yeah. Um, the main parts of a log line are that it's going to show uh, the main character, the central conflict, and gives you a bit of a hook to, to uh, indicate interest, uh, to promote interest. They're your basic elevator pitch. Like, what would you tell an executive if you were riding an elevator with them for 30 seconds? Um, th this, is, this is the two-minute elevator pitch, is, is your log line. Um, so I have an example here. My example is, uh, from the Godfather. Um, mostly cause it's the most log line ish. And so I, I was reading like a whole list of them and, and some of them were the were a way I wanted to like the right formatting, but were movies that I didn't really care about. And others were like movies I cared about, but they were written in funny formats and I didn't like them. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go with we're gonna go with the Godfather. Uh, so the logline for the Godfather is uh, the agery, the aging patriarch of an organized crime dynasty transfers control of his clandestine empire to his reluctant son. So, in my formula, where you have a character plus a descriptor, i.e., a aging patriarch, followed by an event, i.e. He transfers control, followed by a conflict, the son is reluctant. That's that's how you construct a log line. Um, so we're going to do that for this story. And it's going to be bad, because I haven't thought of one yet. Uh, but I have, I, have, I think, uh, a thing... To jump off of a nice a nice diving board uh, and then if we can get th through the log line in about 15 minutes or so I do want to do like a one paragraph synopsis uh, basically summarize how I think the plot of it should go but I don't have a clear idea of that yet either um, I have an idea for how I want several scenes to be uh, I have an idea for um, who the characters are and, and certain things like that, um, but we're going to come back to this, uh, the concept of this um, uh, next episode when we talk about outlining, but I'll write a, I'll write a short summary now. I'm going to do the outline next episode, and I'm going to rewrite the summary right away. Um, basically, what I'm doing is I'm saying... Well, this is the general idea, and then I'm going to go and write something very specific, and then I'm going to come back to my general idea and say, well, this doesn't really isn't accurate anymore. Uh, I'm going to rewrite it to be more accurate, and just keep doing that until I have something that works really, really well. Uh, and I'm probably going to rewrite write the logline and a few other things. It depends on how much it changes and whether or not the logline is still good and, and whatever else, but that's really the way that I'm approaching uh, this process, um, and, and, and I've done that mind map and all that, and, and I'm not afraid to change those relationships if I think they suck when I put them into practice. Um, because 
a few of them probably will. Um, like, I'm still not sure about the Goblin Raiders, and, and the Killer for Hire might be a little weak still. I haven't decided what his role is, because I don't really want him to be an antagonist either. Like, I don't want my three sort of character types to be, to be antagonists. Um, really, I think only the demon is an antagonist, but even still, I'm not sure if he's the real antagonist. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, with, with the logline. And, uh, I'm gonna pull from my document here, my little formula, so I can have it on screen while I do this. Uh, where'd it go? Oh, it's way up here because I switched my seconds around while I was doing it live cool so I'm going to take out that example uh, the three examples here so for me um, the most intriguing character at the moment for me is the siren um, because a, I gave her a really cool mechanical arm, and I'm super curious curious as to why she has that mechanical arm. So I will, I, I'm totally going to come back to that. Uh, but I think also, uh, also the thing with the feather uh, from hers that might be used to stop the ritual, uh, and why the Goblin Raiders want it, uh, and also what she has to do with uh, the moonlit waterfall. Uh, because sirens are traditionally sea creatures, uh, though they are from birds, so maybe there's something to do with that. Um, and also, uh, where'd my... And also, um... Yeah. So, like, what's her relationship with the demon? Why is she at the waterfall? Uh, what's up with the feather? Uh, the mechanical arm, um, all those things. So, I think for me, the siren is most uh, is is probably going to be my main character at the moment. Uh, mostly because I don't know how the billionaire f quite fits in yet. I think his story is going to be intertwined with the demon and the fortunes, and maybe a um... huh. There's a thought. Let me go back into this here. Uh, open. So, there's a thought I'm gonna write down. I'm gonna write this down. We're gonna make this a Faustian style demon. A uh, deal at the cross crossroads, if you will. I don't know if he's going to be the summon guy, but I don't think so. I think he's going to be a patsy, and I wish I could write made today. There we go. Cool. But yeah, Faustian style demon. Awesome. Gotta love Faust. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think the Siren's going to be the main character. I think the killer for hire is going to be a supporting character. Uh, I think the billionaire is going to be uh, a supporting antagonist, but not the main antagonist. I think the demon is going to be the main antagonist, uh, but I'm not sure how that's going to play out yet, because I'm not even sure if he's going to appear in the story. I'm still thinking. I'm still thinking. Um, I also wonder that if I'm really going to do three characters, if something more like a novella rather than a short story would be more accurate. Um, but I'm going to play around with it and see if maybe I can make it uh, how focused I can get it um, before I, I make those decisions. And I was also thinking uh, it might be cool to do three short stories, one for each thread. Uh, and kind of publish them, well, not publish, but like post them as a, a mini collection at the end. Um, so there is that thought too. Uh, and I'm still, I, I, I'm gonna play around with those. Um, so 
So just making notes for myself for, for things to look for later. Uh, when, when I go back and do the show notes and all that. Um, so that, and also maybe novella. Cool. So yeah, uh, I think the siren is my character. Um, and we tend to give a, the, you give your character a descriptor, so you, you, sometimes it's age, sometimes it's, um, defining characteristic, um, certain things like that. Uh, seen a bunch where it's like the, uh, oh, no good examples come to mind right now, but, um, I'm going to say, uh, What's a good term? I want to say disabled, but I don't know if that's the right term. Um, yeah, I have a thought in my head. Give me one second. Siren The Amputated Siren tries to stop a moon. Light, Spellman, Moonlight Ritual, and prevent a demon from being summoned. Boom. Basic logline. Amputated Sirens tries to stop a Moonlight Ritual and prevent a demon from being summoned. So the event that happens is she tries to st she's trying to stop the ritual. Um, and the conflict is that a demon will be summoned. Make sense? Makes sense. And obviously, I'm probably going to revise this as we get further along in the story. Because um, I don't think uh, that's going to work the entire way. But it's, it's a good starting point for now. Because now, uh, I've taken my mind map. And I've created a bunch of relationships. And from those relationships, I've come up with a very basic plot. Like, the beginning, middle, and end of the story is going to be about this siren and her efforts to stop this summoning. Um, so, yeah. Basic plot. Um, and I do have a quick 15 minutes, so I'm going to see if I can just bang out a real quick synopsis here. And obviously this is going to be real rough. And that's fine. Because um, I... Again, I'm I'm going to I'm going to rewrite almost all of this, guaranteed, uh, at some point. Uh, but yeah, so I think the way that I want to do this, um, so think of a synopsis as kind of like if you were sitting down with your friends, how would you describe a movie to them, right? Like if you had, you know, you're, like, you're sitting down with your buddy at, at the lunch ta at the lunchroom table, like how would you describe a movie to them in like a few sentences? Like what is a movie about? So for me, um, a couple of the details that that really jumped out at me from from our mind map um, are. Uh, We have um, the fawn, who's an integral part of the ritual. 
We have uh, the killer for hire who is trying to, to kill the siren. And we have the actual ritual itself. Uh, so, as part of this, um, as part of this, I think for me, uh, the way that I'm going to, uh, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to some, th throw out some, some flash ideas, um, as, as to plot points, I think will work. Um, and I think that's what this synopsis today is just going to be real quick. It's just going to be a, like a quick iteration of plot points that we're going to reassemble later. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm going to say after his crossroads deal falls through. And I'm not sure if I'm going to stick with this sort of Faustian idea, but for the moment I think it's, I think it's good. Um, a uh, fallen. Nah, I'm gonna say destroyed billionaire seeks to regain his power by summoning the demon he made a deal with. Or to do that, he needs the blood of a fawn and the feather of a siren. For the ritual under a moonlight, uh, a winter waterfall. During the rising moon. And I want to do a little bit of research. Uh, when uh during the week where i actually want to look up if there's any notable sirens in greek mythology and if there's any cool stories surrounding them uh because i'm curious now as to whether or not i want to do it like kind of like you do the muses right like calliope is a muse um sort of style thing but uh i have to think about it and i gotta see if there's actually any any work cool things so So under the water of rising moon, uh, and then ancient siren, and this is gonna be super typical, and I'm probably gonna cut it later, but I'm gonna, it's gonna it's gonna stay there for now. I'm a little iffy about it. I'm a little iffy. Ah no, I'm not, I'm, I'm cutting it. I'm cutting that idea. I don't think it's good. I'm good. I'm not gonna do it. I think it's good. So, we're going to say that she has to escape killer for hire and goblin raiders looking for the feathers. Ancient Siren has to escape a killer for hire and goblin raiders looking for her feathers and so that she can stop the ritual And 
prevent the demon from being summoned. So there you go. There's there's my general synopsis, uh, which will give me a great a great sort of thing to start outlining. Uh, which I'm, I'm glad I got to it because it, it'll be a good a good foundation to start outlining from on the next episode. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that's all I got for that part tonight. So, uh, as always, for the last part of the show. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Accidental Book Club. Um, and I really need to write an actual spiel for the book club. Uh, but basically the gist is, is that I have a ton of books about writing uh, that I've collected over the years, especially when I was in school and stuff for writing. I uh, have not read nearly enough of them. And as part of uh, the whole sort of learning experience that we have going on here, uh, I am going to read them and I would love it if you read books along with me. Um, so yeah, um, this week's book, uh, is the foundations of screenplay by Sid Field. Uh, it's a classic in the screenwriting, uh, in, in kind of the screenwriting world. Um, and an interesting note that I learned today that, uh, Sid Field actually died the year that I, uh, the, the, the week that I dropped out of, of screenwriting, <laughs> uh, which is a crazy coincidence of pr monstrous proportions, but, uh, that's really, it's really intense. Um, so yeah, um, uh, what do I think about this book? Um, it's really neat. Um, Sid Field uh, has studied a lot of different people. He studied film under uh, under Jean Renoir, uh, the great French French director, a uh, master of depth of field and, and, and deep focus and stuff. Uh, I love I love his shot composition. He's really really cool. Uh, Jean Renoir actually being the son of the very famous uh, French painter Renoir, uh, the impressionist. Uh, so yeah, very, very talented artistically, uh, that family is. Um, and Field writes in his book about how uh, Jean, uh, Jean uh, experiments with, with lighting and composition the same way that his father, uh, his father experimented with, with, with color and, and, and shape. Um, and that's a super interesting concept for me. Um, I haven't gotten too deep into it, unfortunately. Um, but I have been discussing uh, some of the things I've learned where he talks about what makes up a screenplay and the differences between novels and plays and, uh, and all that. And I think those are important distinctions to make because uh, they, they do have different elements. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, talking about how a novel is, is, is basically done for, from uh, a mindscape. You're always seeing into the character's head. Or, or a character's head, not necessarily the main character, but you're, you're seeing into somebody's head, and you're getting impressions, and there's, it's easy to give you an unreliable narrator, and, and lots of different things that come with that, um, we're, we're part of their thought process. And then you look at plays, and plays are kind of this weird thing where um, the audience is like the fourth wall, and, and they're, you're, you're kind of peeking in onto these characters talking about their lives, and, and their dreams, and their hopes, and, and all that stuff. Um, and a film is a totally different beast where it's, uh, you, you, you see real things. Like if you're looking at an apartment building, you see that guy who's shaving his armpits in, in 3B. Like th that's a thing you can see. And sometimes that th those details matter. And, and it's, it's just a whole different type of visual narrative. I mean, comics are different entirely because you kind of get a little bit of a novel, but a little bit of a play, but but kind of a film because it's very cinematic and visual. Um, and you can tell the, the, the comic book artists and stuff who have studied film, like cinematography, uh, they, they have a different approach to it. Um, and, and, and you can do interesting things with the way that the panels are laid out and, and, and pacing of panels and splitting up dialogue in certain ways. And, and a lot of things that you can do with that. Uh, so they're, they're 
I'm glad that he, he talks about those things because uh, I think they're important to learn. Uh, his ideas about uh, the construction of a novel, or sorry, the construction of a uh, of a plot are, are super important, and, and I and I brought it up here. Like this is the Sidfield paradigm, where you break up uh, uh, the story into, into three acts. Um, the first act is a pro- pro- um, and I don't and I'll buy page numbers. Uh, the the Hollywood the Hollywood paradigm is is vastly changing uh, from the way it was when when Sidfield wrote and edited this book um because it's, it's been quite a few years uh but hollywood doesn't do uh 90 minute films in the same way that they used to uh he talks about where like uh fil- like a lot of studios used to have a definite contract on their film where it couldn't be more than two hours eight minutes uh because that was like the maximum like if it was that long or shorter, you could you could get the maximum number of screenings so that you could make more money and, and all this stuff. Um, that's not super true anymore. Uh, we see a lot more movies that are more like two and a half hours, uh, sometimes longer than that. Uh, especially like those superhero epics, like the Avengers and, and Captain America and all that stuff. It, it, it's, it's a different style uh, than it used to be. Uh, that's not to say that they still don't make ninety minute movies because they do, uh, but it's 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 not un, it's not extremely uncommon to see a much longer film. Um, so yeah, I don't buy into the page numbers that he includes in the book. They're not on this actual this this diagram, but they are they are in the book where he talks about you know Act One is like twenty to thirty pages and Act Two is like sixty pages and and all that. <laughs> So, so yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, and, and I do actually um, abide a lot by this paradigm. I mean, obviously, it's, structure is, is super important to how uh, a narrative is, is, is constructed. Uh, and this one is very... Um, Sid Fields is, is the most commonly adopted one uh, nowadays. And uh, has actually draws a lot from Aristotle and, and uh, how storytelling has been for, for, for many, many years. Um, obviously, the medium that you're in determines a lot more how the structure works. Um, but good structure, good structure can, can, can really help your story. Uh, it helps you... Uh, a from getting like things like writer's block and all that because you kind of have a clear indication of where where you are and where you're going, and um, and yeah, it, it just for me for me as someone who who's kind of like has that block and chips away at it, structure is, is the the easiest way for me to do that, um, and we'll and we'll talk about these things a little bit more next episode and more when we're talking about plot and outlining and stuff like that, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a lot to read about this book. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start closing out the show now, but, um, a note for, um, for the next episode, because I'm not going to be here next week, uh, there's not going to be an episode next week. Uh, there's going to be an episode the week after on May 29th. Um, in that episode, I'm actually going to do a double book club because of the week break. Uh, so I'm going to read Sid Field again next week, and I'm going to finish it. Uh, but then on the next episode, I'm going to cover Sid Field, and I'm also going to cover uh, the first episode of the next book, which I believe is going to be the annotated H.P. Lovecraft. Um, and the reason being for that is because I want to do something by my influences, uh, but I didn't want to just read fiction as part of this book club. Uh, so the annotated H.P. Lovecraft actually has references, uh, annotated references uh, to history, influence, films made by certain things, uh, things that influenced H.P. Lovecraft, things that uh, were influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. 
Uh, so it has a lot more notes about the general idea of writing and, and, and all that as a whole. So I think it'll be okay. Um, I think I think you guys will give me a pass on it. And I haven't read the complete annotated edition. I've read a bunch of H.P. Lovecraft short stories, but I haven't read the full like book book. So I want to do that. So when I come back for the for the next episode in two weeks, uh, I'm gonna do uh, an extra long uh, book club segment on both of them. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's what I'm gonna do with that. Uh, if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, uh, give it another, you know, give it a couple minutes, a few minutes to hang out and, and, and chat and uh, answer some questions. And then I'm going to close her out uh, for tonight. And I actually hit the two and a half hour mark pretty, pretty spot on. So that's cool. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's cause, um, I have you have it like open right here. Uh, oh, I guess the other thing to, to mention, uh, the thing about uh, writing a screenplay or any sort of film script is that uh, if you do it with the right formatting, like the formatting everyone uses, it ends up being about one minute per page, uh, no matter whether it's action description or, um, or dialogue. Sorry, well, I won't hit the desk anymore. Uh, whether it's action or dialogue, it ends up being about one minute per page. So uh, when you see scripts, uh, when executives see scripts, they can judge a script, like how long it's gonna be basically by the, by the length of the script. It's not 100% accurate. Uh, there are exceptions. Um, Field mentions in the script that the, the Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring is 118 page scripts, but it's like a three hour movie. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it changes. That being said, I, I actually, uh, as I was reading this, I opened up the Lord of the Ring script. Um, I'm gonna go back to the big face for a bit there. Uh, I opened up the Lord of the Ring script and I was reading it and the first like uh, few scenes are like minute for minute based on the page and it's, it's really cool. Um, so, so the, the reason he talks about it being 108, uh, 28 pages is, uh, it's, it's, it's an economic decision. Uh, when the book, when this book was written, uh, it's approximately 10,000 to 12,000 USD per minute to shoot a Hollywood film. Uh, so, uh, so like it's expensive to shoot long movies. Uh, I think that's a little bit less true nowadays, um, though it is still somewhat true. I think uh, better technology and uh, and certain things like green screens and a lot of other stuff has made it easier to do certain things, so it doesn't take as long to shoot them. Uh, but it still takes a long time and it's still expensive. Uh, so a two-hour movie has an advantage in the theaters because you can put more showings of it in a day uh, compared to a longer movie. More screenings, mean more ticket sales, and more like more screenings uh, means that they can potentially have more ticket sales because there's more things that people can go to, and uh, making more money means m more movies will be made, and it's a business decision and, and a lot of stuff. I don't know why specifically 128. I think that's just something that's evolved over time. Uh, but yeah, um, he also knows that it's, it's kind of weird. He, he knows that foreign films tend to be a little shorter than 120 minutes. And I've never really found that to be true. I always thought that foreign films were longer, uh, but I don't know. It's weird, right? Um, interesting on perspective. That being said, I have no idea how many short, like foreign films Sid Field actually watches, uh, other than... Or, or watched. Yeah, and, and so you bring up an interesting uh, interesting point, Sam, where you ask about there's also an ideal length for a movie before people start getting restless, and that's totally true. Um, but but uh, there are long movies that you don't notice being long. And I think that's an indicator of a really good writer when you can be in a long movie and it doesn't feel long to you. Uh, 
like there's been certain films uh there's been certain films that I know that like gravity did not feel like the length that it did to me it's pretty long it's like over two hours uh but the, it, it, it's just it's, it's always got something happening and and whatever's happening is always important so I think I think when you write it well uh having a long movie doesn't necessarily mean that it, it, it's restless it's just if, if it's a long movie and, and it's like it, it can just be worse like <laughs> Yeah, uh, what was I watching? There was... There was a movie I watched uh, not too long ago. I'm trying to remember what it is. But it had like five endings. And it was super confusing. Because I just kept felt like it was ending and then it didn't. Um, and that movie made me a little restless. Because it was just like, it's like oh, oh, we're coming to a conclusion and conclusion. And it's just like, nope. Yanked yeah, it away again. And I was just like, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and I think I think your comment about the public attention span is correct. I think that's why theaters in general are not doing nearly as well as they used to. Uh, um, because there's so much more benefit. There's so many more benefits to watching on demand, um, like video on demand. And that's why Netflix is way more popular and like all that other stuff. Like you can watch things at your own pace, whatever you want. You can pause things. You can walk away. You can get all the new content. I think there is still always going to be theaters. I think there are going to be, um, I think they have to be a lot more selective about what they are, what they screen, uh, and what they do. Uh, because I think there are movies that need to be experienced in theater. I think Gravity was one of those for me. Um, uh, Pulp Fiction, seeing Pulp Fiction in an actual theater on the original film reel was amazing. Uh, I would love to see a Kurosawa film on a screen, uh, on an actual theater. Um, I should look out for that. I, I would love to see a Kurosawa film. Uh, I think to a certain extent, big budget Hollywood action flicks, uh, like, like the Marvel movies and all that are, are worth seeing in theater. Uh, but I don't think they have to be seen in theater. Unlike movies like Gravity. I think Gravity was a, like a, you have to see this in theater type movie. I think the, the expanse of space and the concept that it's trying to get across just works when it's so much bigger than life. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I kind of think. Um, but yeah, if that's everything, which I think it is, um, I think that's everything. So uh, I'm gonna close out the show. So my name is Brendan, I'm a writer. And this is Accidental Origin. Uh, just a quick reminder, because I haven't said it enough. I won't be here next week, but I will be back on May 29th. Uh, shows every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, yeah. Uh, check out my website at accidentalorigin.com. Uh, yeah, have a good night, guys.